Hello, I'm David Rosen, Chair of the IOF Rules Commission, and this session is about rules interpretation, particularly as it applies to course setting. I'd like to thank Helga Lang Pedersen, who's the incoming Chair of the IOF Photo Commission, for his help in devising this presentation and providing many of the examples. Appendix 6, Competition Formats of the OF Rules and the two IOF Course Planning Guidelines for Forest and Sprint, mention most of the principles that need to be taken into account to plan courses so that they provide adequate challenge to top athletes, a fair so that being lucky is not decisive, and can provide exciting presentations in arenas, internet and TV. We will constantly strive to follow the, the course planning principles to achieve these goals. This also means that we must maintain a dialogue about how the principles are successfully applied in our events. This presentation provides cases from 2022 selected with the purpose of supporting our learning. All of the cases are centred around the coexistence of Rule 17.2 and the IOF mapping standards and the fundamental principle that links these two together. The fundamental principle is that the mapping standards specify how terrain features are displayed on the maps. And then the rules section 17.2 specify what terrain features are forbidden to pass or cross. There are separate specifications for orienteering maps for forest, that's ISOM, and for sprint, that's IS. SPROM. More or less all jury cases in 2022 were centred around this theme. We are committed to greatly reducing the number of such cases in the future. Let's look at Rule 17.2. It says, out of bounds or dangerous areas, forbidden routes, line features that must not be crossed, etc. must be marked on the map. Where they are not obvious to the competitor, they must also be marked on the ground. Competitors must not enter, follow or cross areas, routes or features drawn with the following symbols. ISOM 520, area that shall not be entered. ISOM 708, out of bounds boundary. ISOM 709, out of bounds area. ISOM 711 out of bounds route, although competitors are allowed to cross directly over an out of bounds route. ISOM 520 is olive green and the other three are purple. And you'll notice that this list is rather short. In ISOM, there are a number of uncrossable or impassable features. You won't be disqualified if you cross these features, but you may not be physically able to cross them, certainly not safely. I've listed them below. So why is it permitted to cross those ISOM features? Why don't we just make all the so-called uncrossable or impassable features not allowed to cross? Well, forests often have very many dangerous features in them, particularly in Scandinavia, where there are many cliffs and lakes, in the Czech Republic, where there are enormous cliffs and towers. It's the responsibility of the competitor to take sensible routes to ensure their own safety. And some features that are uncrossable for an older competitor may be easy to cross for an elite athlete. It's often difficult to map the exact limits to show where a feature is uncrossable. 
and some features, especially water features, can be easy to cross in dry periods, but impossible to cross at other times. It would not be practical to detect whether competitors have crossed these features. In sprint, the situation is very different. The MAP standard ISS PROM is used and the competition area tends to be much smaller. It's much more practical to post marshals at any features where you're concerned that competitors may illegally cross a feature. Often the uncrossability of the feature is more to do with permissions rather than safety. So there's quite a long list in Sprint of items that are not allowed to cross and these are listed in Rule 17.2. Let's look at the rule about sanctions and in particular about disqualification. It's in the fair play section of the rules, section 26 and 26.10 says a competitor who breaks any rule or who, who benefits from the breaking of any rule may be sanctions. And the sanctions that may be applied include disqualification. The other ones aren't really relevant for us at the moment. The event organiser, or as a result of a protest, the jury has responsibility for imposing sanctions during an event, defined as the event programme in the event bulletin. Notice that the event organiser doesn't need to wait for a complaint or a protest. If they found that a competitor has broken a rule, then the event organiser has the power to disqualify them. But also notice that it deliberately says the competitor may be sanctioned. And that's because for very minor violations of a rule, perhaps where the competitor didn't mean to do anything wrong, accidentally broke a rule, but perhaps didn't gain any benefit, then the organiser should exercise their judgment as to whether the breaking of the rule merits disqualification. It's quite common nowadays for competitors to be carrying a GPS tracker, often provided by the organiser. So can GPS tracks be used as evidence to disqualify? Well, GPS evidence is no different to any other evidence. When considering whether to disqualify, we need to take into account the reliability of the evidence. If a course official said that they saw a competitor go out of bounds, we must check that the official has correctly identified the competitor and had a clear view to see the incident. Similarly, with GPS, you must consider the accuracy of the GPS track. We all know that where there are tall buildings, for example, the GPS track can be quite a long way off from where the competitor actually ran. So does the GPS track show the competitor going right across a feature that is forbidden to cross? Or does the GPS just appear to show the competitor going into an area that's forbidden for a few metres and then out again. When you're a planner, event advisor or member of the jury dealing with a protest, it's important to have the correct mindset. Look with the eyes of a competitor who has never seen the area before. For example, a complex area, particularly with multiple running levels, can seem easy to interpret once you've been there. In WOC 2022, one multi-level area was, quite rightly, rejected for use in the WOC event as being unfair, even though it was mapped correctly according to the latest ISSPROM standard. 
On the left, you can see the multi-level area in Colling that was used for the public races associated with the WOC 2022. But for the WOC races themselves, you can see the map on the right where it was just shown as out of bounds. It's now quite common practice to add artificial barriers to create route choice. But you can't just draw out of bounds areas or barriers on the map with nothing on the ground. If you're putting in new artificial barriers, they need to be very clear to the competitor, but usually you still need to allow the public to pass through. In WOC 2022, you can see the sort of setup at the bottom here where there were overlapping barriers. So it appeared when you first looked at it as though you couldn't get through, but when you got closer, uh, you could dodge through the barriers if you were a member of the public. Even so, at least one competitor had to be disqualified for running through. You'll remember in 17.2, in relation to uncrossable features or out of bounds areas, it says where they are not obvious to the competitor, they must also be marked on the ground. So in a sprint area, it's necessary for the planner and event advisor to go round the course, taping any out of bounds features or areas that are not obviously forbidden to cross or to enter. But there is a limit to what you can do. You can't, for example, tape off people's private driveways. They might need to get their car out. So we should not necessarily disqualify a runner who accidentally goes into an untaped out of bounds area and then comes back out again. Hedges are often a problem where they separate two areas that are both in bounds. They are usually mapped with the dark green ISSPROM 411 uncrossable vegetation, which means you are not allowed to cross the hedge. In practice, such hedges often do have gaps which the public use to pass through them. Runners may well see such a gap and think that it is OK for them to go through. So what are your options? One is to carefully map all the gaps as gaps in the line on the map. Another is to tape off all the gaps, and that may be the, the best option. Another alternative might be to mark the hedge on the map with green ISSPROM 410, which just means vegetation fight, and would allow people to pass through. That might be suitable if it really doesn't matter whether the runners push through the hedge or not. In this case, it should be mentioned in the final bulletin as 4.10 is very difficult to distinguish from 4.11. I mentioned before that we need to try and look through the eyes of the competitor. The runners don't always look at the detail. They need to simplify as much as possible. For example, if they can see a building 100 metres ahead that they need to go round, they won't check every detail on the way. If, for example, one particular piece of grass is out of bounds, while similar areas are OK to run across, it's not good enough to simply mark that on the map with olive green. It needs to be taped off. Now let's look at some examples from the 2022 season. In the knockout sprint qualification race in the first World Cup, round in Sweden this year. There was an area where the border between the yellow area and the outer bounds area was not visible in the terrain and therefore was taped as shown in the pictures. 
Is the taping adequate, do you think? The photos show the direction from the red arrows in the map. It is unusual to have borders between yellow areas and outer bounds areas that are completely invisible in the terrain. In such occasions, it's recommended to make sure that the taping is easily visible from a distance. And with it just lying across the ground, it wasn't easy to see in this case. So in situations like these, it's recommended to place the taping around one metre above the ground and make sure that the tape is not twisted. In the knockout sprint semi-final, there was an instance where runners cut through a gap in a hedge. You can see that in the picture at the bottom of the screen. And you can see it also on the map extract where the red line goes through the uncrossable hedge. In fact, the area shown with 411, the dark green was passed by four athletes, while two athletes went further round on the blue route choice. It was evaluated that athletes running at full speed were not able to distinguish between the paved area opening on the map just south of the place and the actual passing place. After consideration, the overall conclusion was that this gap should have been taped shut by the organiser. Given the fact that it was not, what should be done? Disqualifying those who went through or creating an unfair situation for those who actually read the map properly and didn't go through. In the actual situation, the jury decided that it was unfair to disqualify those athletes who were tricked by the opening in the bushes, but added the first of those who took the blue line into the final, due to an evaluation that this was where his final position was lost. This, of course, wasn't popular with the other athlete who took the blue choice. And it did cause complications further on when they then had seven athletes in the final. We're now moving on to an example from the Junior World Championships earlier this year. The sprint, which did go ahead, unlike the forest races. And there was an area of buildings with gardens around them and in most places the gardens as you can see are delineated by borders such as fences or walls which are marked on the map but in this particular case uh, in the center of the map extract there was a olive green area that was not bordered by a fence or wall and that's shown on the map and you can see in the pictures it just looks like a bit of rough open. So the rule says where they're not obvious to the, to the competitor they must also be marked on the ground. Should this boundary have been taped? The area shown with olive green was similar in the terrain to an area that would often have been mapped as 401 open land or 403 rough open land. There was no fence, wall or other distinct feature dividing the paved area and the area marked with olive green 520. So that's an argument for taping. 
The argument against is that athletes are responsible for reading their map and there were no similar areas nearby that athletes were allowed to pass. Thus, it should have been clear that the athletes were not allowed to leave the paved area. However, the conclusion is that in this case, taping would have taken away the possible doubt. And thus the recommendation is to use taping in such places. In the map extract, you can see that the athletes in purple and yellow probably did go around the end of the outer bounds area. This is an example of the GPS trap not being exactly accurate, but it's probable that the dark purple athlete did cut across the area illegally. So the question is, should the athlete be disqualified? So the SEA considered it and evaluated that it was not fair to the athletes that the place was not taped, since they had been extremely careful to tape in similar places. Thus, they decided not to disqualify the athletes that had passed the area. In retrospect, was this the right decision? After the event, the decision was heavily discussed. It was argued that it was unfair to those athletes who had not gone across the outer bounds area and therefore had lost a second or two. It was also argued that we as a sport rely on the agreements we make with landowners. Thus, we need to make it very clear to athletes that they are responsible for not entering areas that are outer bounds. So the SEA conclusions for the future were, were after the event and after having considered the very reasonable comments made by athletes and team officials regarding this situation, the organiser and SEA were not sure if the right decision was made in those hectic hours in Carapito in the summer of 2022. So for the future, they will aim to avoid such situations by taping, but will also strive to support the fairness towards those who follow the rules. Often in retrospect, it's difficult to be sure if you did make the right decision. In this case, note that in contrast to the knockout sprint example that we looked at a few minutes earlier, only a, a second or two were probably gained in this case by the athlete who cut across. And that's less likely to be so significant in just an ordinary sprint compared to a knockout sprint. We're now going to look at the famous or infamous WOC 2022 sprint relay and what happened on the men's leg 12 to 13 on leg two. A number of athletes were approaching an underpass underneath the railway, but instead of going under the underpass, they turned left and entered an out of bounds area north of the railway. They went quite far along before they understood their mistake. Then they came back out the same way they came in. You can see in the top right hand map section, the GPS tracks showing them going into the olive green. Meanwhile, Ralph Street didn't follow them and went along the green route underneath the railway. On the red route, here's Thomas Crivder uh, disappearing up the side of the building and into the olive green. The GPS shows that the four teams ran north of the railroad, although due to GPS offset, 
they are shown as if they were on the railway railroad. That wasn't the case. And in the bottom right, we have the GPS showing the four teams running back out the same way and continuing on the right route with a time loss of approximately 60 seconds, which was quite critical in determining the results of the relay. After the incident, it was considered that there was no organiser mistake not to have marked the outer bounds area with tape. It was considered so unlikely that a thing like this would happen, that no one would expect an organiser to take this situation into account. The athletes that made this mistake also agreed to this. The next question was if the teams should be disqualified. Of course, they'd clearly broken rules 17.2, which is on the left. So this was discussed. Finally, it was evaluated that the four teams got no benefit from the mistake. They made it out the same way as they came in and that the time loss in itself was enough penalty. In the end, the four teams ended up in positions 3, 4, 7 and 10. So Norway and Switzerland made it to the podium due to a strong finish of the third and fourth leg runners. This result led to complaint and protests that were eventually turned down by the jury. The only conclusion here is that we must try to expect the unexpected and that this becomes more true in sprint mass start events since the speed of the athletes is extreme in these formats. This prompts me to make a small digression uh, to discuss my opinion about the way that bridges with only one running level are mapped. I heard many comments in relation to the walk sprint relay. How could those runners have made that mistake? I believe that it may have been difficult for those runners to understand that they were supposed to be passing under the railway. The underpass is correctly mapped according to the latest guidelines for complex urban structures. Using the new triangle symbol and showing the path under the railway in brown as though it were visible from above. You can see the map on the bottom left here. There are several more examples on the map. There's another one on the right here. The new triangles along with the striped areas are very helpful when there are two running levels. But where there is only one running level, as with an underpass under a railway, I think that it is much clearer and simpler to use the grey canopy symbol 522. If you look at the map on the left, which is actually near King's Cross in London, you can see three underpasses under the railway, which are all shown very clearly with the grey canopy symbol. The IOF Futo and Rules Commission hope to discuss this issue with the IOF Map Commission in January. Here's another incident from the WOC Sprint Relay on the Women's Leg 4. You can see the blue track and that was Caitlin Young passing through an artificial barrier which led to the disqualification of the Canadian team. So, as I mentioned, even though I thought the barriers were very clear and well constructed, uh, it was still possible to pass through them, perhaps by mistake. So far, we've been looking at examples from sprint races, but problems can occur in the forest as well with uncrossable areas, even though the number of areas that are forbidden to enter or cross are much more limited. Here is a case from the European Championships this year, and it involved 
a river crossing. And you can see, if you look carefully at the map section on the map, that the GBS track shows the person with a green track crossing the river. So the question is, should that athlete or any others who cross the river be disqualified? As can be seen from Rule 17.2, the signature ISOM 301, dark blue, uncrossable body of water, is not among the signatures that are forbidden to cross. Thus, the athletes did nothing wrong when they went through the river, as long as they were out of the area shown with the purple ISOM 709 out of bounds area. However, as can be seen from the tracking, you can see the pink line to the right. Many athletes interpreted the intention of the course setter to be that river crossing was not allowed and then took the long route south of the outer bounds area and thus lost a lot of time. We want to avoid this kind of unfairness. So the conclusion is that it is the course setter's responsibility to eliminate unfair situations, since the course setter is expected to know the conditions with the river water level at the time of competition. This may not be the same as at the time of mapping. The course setter should either allow river crossings and state clearly in the final bulletin that river crossing is possible, or not allow river crossings and thus mark the river with symbols ISOM 708 and or 709, that's in purple. At least one athlete went into the area shown with purple hashing, ISOM 709, and then realised their mistake and ran back out the same way. You can see that in the green track. Should the athlete be disqualified? In the bottom right, you can see a picture of what it looked like at the entrance to the outer bounds area. There was a red and yellow tape which was laid along the ground. And there was a rather small notice which said that it was forbidden to enter although actually it's not quite clear whether that applies to orienteers. Very often in orienteering, we get permission to enter areas where the public are not allowed to go. It's clear from the rules that entering the area marked with purple hashing is not allowed. The question is what to do when the athlete seems not to have done this on purpose and has turned around when they realised and thus had no benefit from breaking the rule. The conclusion was that the athlete is not disqualified. But a lesson from this is that taping should be very visible and placed well above the ground. If this is not possible, perhaps because vehicles need to be able to pass, then the passage must be manned an athlete should be stopped if attempting to enter. At the European Championships relay, towards the end of the course, two fences had to be passed as shown on the map. You can see them going diagonally up the map and across the map just north of J and K. Is this an adequate way to mark mandatory crossing points of the fences. As can be seen from the rules extract in the previous slide, the signature ISOM 518, impassable fence, is not among the features that are not allowed to cross. Thus, it is allowed to cross the fence if it's not marked with the additional signature ISOM 708 out of bounds boundary. 
The map to the right shows how this should have been marked if the intention was that the fence was not allowed to cross. So it's important to always be careful with signatures labelled in ISOM as impassable or uncrossable. Despite those terms, it is allowed to cross these features unless they're marked also with one of the out of bounds signatures mentioned for ISOM in Rule 17.2. In the World Cup relay in Switzerland, a relay leg passed relatively close to the arena in a tough uphill climb. The upper part of the slope was marked as out of bounds area using ISOM 709 out of bounds area symbol. It wasn't marked in the terrain and there was no definite border. Should the boundary of the out of bounds area have been marked with a purple line and marked with tape in the terrain? The situation is complicated by the fact that the line of the legs seven to eight passes through the outer bounds area. With no taping, we saw that there was a clear threat that some athletes would, by mistake, get into the outer bounds area. Probably the best situation would have been, to the greatest extent possible, to have the boundary of the outer bounds area following features that are easy to see in the terrain and to have marked the border on the map with a purple line and also marked with tape in the terrain. The line between seven and eight would probably then be interrupted over quite a long distance. If such a solution is used, it is advised to inform about a leg line being interrupted in the final bulletin. Now let's look in more detail at what actually happened. A big group of athletes misread the map and did get into the out of bounds area. You can see that on the GPS tracking here. When they realised their mistake by seeing the parking area at the top of the slope, they turned back out of the area again. Should the athletes have been disqualified? After the race, the organiser conducted interviews with the athletes that had been in the Outer Bounds area. It was evaluated that the athletes did not enter the area on purpose and got no benefit from doing so. So it was agreed not to disqualify the athletes since it was obvious that they did not know how far they'd come up in the slope and gain nothing from the route choice. In the long race in the World Cup in Switzerland, there was a nature conservation area in the terrain, which was marked as out of bounds with ISOM 709 purple hashing. So the question is, should the boundary of the out of bounds area have been marked with a purple line and marked with tape in the terrain? If the boundary is marked, it will make it easier for athletes to navigate along the boundary. But if it's not marked, it's possible that athletes taking the middle route choice will enter the area by mistake. So in a similar future situation, it's advised to mark the boundary with ISOM 708 as shown here and taped in the terrain where the ISOM 708 line is shown. Now let's look at what actually happened. At least one athlete seems to have cut the corner of the nature conservation area. Whether the GPS signal is true or not is hard to tell, but probably the athlete had to navigate quite thoroughly in order not to cut the corner of the area. If the GPS is accurate, then probably H I'd with the red track had an advantage compared to the competitor with the blue track, since cutting that corner 
allowed for having a less steep climb into the control. Should HI'd the red athlete be disqualified? Since the boundary was not taped, it would have been difficult to know as an athlete exactly when you were in or out of the area. The conclusion was that HI should not be disqualified. First of all, because the accuracy of the GPS probably is not high enough. And secondly, because it is difficult to know your exact location in a slope like the one in question. However, if the area is actually sensitive and agreement with the Forest Administration is made not to enter the area, it may be a problem for the sport if we cannot guarantee that athletes will stay out. Thus, taping seems to be a good option, although it takes time and effort to hang the tapes accurately and to collect them afterwards. In the World Masters Sprint Qualification in Italy, a complaint and then a protest was, was received that the outer bounds area next to Control 22 was not properly visible. That led to the competitor failing by a few seconds to qualify for the A final. The competitor ran along to where the red arrow is pointing, where it had actually been taped off and then had to double back to get round to Control 22. The complaints and protests were rejected on the grounds that the olive green was visible if you look carefully and it was the same for all competitors. But it is difficult to distinguish such very small areas of olive green. It probably would have been clearer to use purple to show the lower part of the passage as out of bounds. There were tapes at the bottom, at the west end, so the organiser or the SEA had clearly recognised that there was a problem here. But if you got there, you had already wasted time. So to wrap up, as you can see in 2022, we had several incidents due to challenges in interpreting rules section 17.2. Our ambition is to achieve three things. Planners, organisers and event advisors must understand exactly which features are forbidden to enter or cross and which are just titled uncrossable or impassable, but are not actually forbidden. We should be extremely careful to place very visible marking tape in boundaries at the edge of areas that are out of bounds. And we need to be consistent in disqualifying athletes that enter out of bounds areas when they got a significant benefit from it. As event advisors, we ask you to be careful in looking for and handling such cases in order to avoid these kinds of incidents. Just as a footnote, a few thoughts. Orienteering is a complex sport in an uncontrolled environment. Most sports are played in a much more standardised arena. The rules cannot cover every circumstance, but we must do our very best to anticipate and prevent problems. When a problem has occurred, there is often no perfect solution. We have to understand that there may be criticism, whatever is decided. Thanks very much for listening.